This is Unit 6, Video 2. In this unit, we will take a look at temperature, one of the parameters that we can measure about a gas, or about any substance, but especially about a gas. And temperature is nicely defined in terms of gases, and it is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So kinetic energy is kind of the key here. Now, kinetic energy is a physics concept, and it's the energy of motion. Kinetic just means you're in motion, and which applies to any type of sphere, like a basketball or a bullet. Uh, if your uh, bullet's really not a sphere, but any uh, type of object that, that is moving, essentially. And uh, since little tiny gas particles are also little spheres, you can think of them as little tiny spheres, kinetic energy applies to them. Now, the kinetic energy equation is here. You may have seen this equation before from physics or from a freshman physics class. Here it says kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So this m is mass and v is velocity. Now what this shows you is that as, say, the mass increases, if you have a heavier particle, if you have a he heavier ball like a bowling ball, then the velocity of that bowling ball must decrease to keep the kinetic energy the same. In other words, these are inversely related. Inversely. And what happens is it's not perfectly inversely related because there's a squared here. So if you have a heavier particle, it will travel slower. And that's kind of the idea. And vice versa. If you have a lighter particle, the mass goes down. Say if you have a helium particle, uh, then helium has a really, really low mass, so its velocity will be very, very high. This equation will have an effect. Um, later on, we'll use it to actually determine the molar masses of gases, which is really neat. We can determine the molar mass just by using this equation successfully. Okay, the, sometimes temperature is graphed, and here is a visual of what you'll see. If you take now the average kinetic energy, you have to realize that most gas particles are actually any container. So if you have a container of a bunch of gases, you have literally billions upon billions of gas particles in the container. And most of them will have an average energy. Some of them will have a very low kinetic energy, some will have a very high kinetic energy. Some are moving slow, some are moving fast, but most of them have roughly an average kinetic energy. And what you can do is you can graph them, and this is what's called the bell curve. This type of uh, graph is used for very, very large populations or large sample sizes in, uh, in science. And here it just says that, uh, for example, if you have a particle at zero degrees Celsius, or a gas sample at zero degrees Celsius, you'll get this bell curve. And so where most of the particles have a molecular speed around 5 times 10 to the second meters per second, which is about 500 meters per second. Uh, and uh, if you move it to 100 degrees Celsius, notice the curve actually moves a little to the right, which we would expect because we got more kinetic energy, so the average actually moves. A bigger portion of the molecules now have an average kinetic energy. And this is the bell curve that you'll, you'll see with these. The, the most important thing for you to see here is, here it says as temperature increases, the molecular speeds will also increase. So here, for example, uh, originally, if you graph this blue portion of the lower temperature, so this would be lower temperature, that's how many particles you have that have a higher, you can say, speed. And then at a higher temperature, uh, you'll actually have a higher percentage of molecules with that speed. So notice now we get to take this portion as well, uh, so this whole area, and we have a higher speed for the molecules. That's kind of the idea here. Uh, now, don't get confused. Don't worry too much about this curve. We're not going to do too much more with the curve. It's just we have to use a special curve because we have a very large sample size. The most important thing for us is as temperature increases, that means kinetic energy increases, which means the particles are actually moving faster. Okay, so we can ask a question like this. What's the difference between helium atoms in a 20 degrees Celsius bottle and in a 100 degrees Celsius bottle? So if you have two bottles, each contain helium atoms. This is 20 Celsius, and we'll say the bottles are closed. Helium can't uh, escape, and this is 100 Celsius. Now, the 100 degrees Celsius actually has more kinetic energy. Because we have more kinetic energy, the particles are moving faster on average. So if you were to visualize the particles, you'd see these particles moving much faster, not much faster, because the temperature is not that much higher than these particles, and that's the idea. You can actually determine how much faster using this equation. We're not going to do it now, we'll do it later. You can actually determine exactly how much faster they are, what the velocity, what the new velocity is, because 
uh, of the increase. The second question asks, which gas particles are moving faster, argon atoms at 25 Celsius or helium atoms at 25 Celsius? So now, since you have argon, now if you take a look at argon, argon has a different mass on the periodic table. So argon on the periodic table actually has a mass of 39.95, I believe, whereas helium has a mass on the periodic table of only 4 grams. So because argon is so much more heavy, and because they're both at the same temperature, their kinetic energy is actually the same. So we can say kinetic energy is the same because they're at the same temperature. Kinetic energy is related to temperature. But because the argon atoms are heavier, in this case we have 1 half mv squared, because the mass is greater for argon, the velocity must be less for the kinetic energy, energy to stay the same. That's the idea. If you simply remember that heavier particles travel slower, lighter particles travel faster, for now that's good enough. Eventually we can uh, calculate exactly how much faster they're moving. Again, and we'll do that later on. All right, let's uh, give you a few other uh, terms. These are more vocab terms that relate to this motion. Diffusion is applied to gases. It can be applied really to any substance, liquid, solids, but it's usually applied to gases. And it simply means the mixing of two gases caused by their random motion. Because gas particles move so much, diffusion applies especially to gases. Here it says heavier gases will diffuse slower. So here what you've got is you've got these red particles or uh, magenta particles that uh, are allowed to diffuse over time. So you know, it usually takes just a few, a few minutes, sometimes a few seconds, and the diffusion is done. And here are the particles all over the place, essentially. They're completely mixed. So if you have a heavier gas, and if the gas is, if you can smell the gas, you can actually sense the, ga the heavier gas, or the lighter gas will be sensed faster than the uh, heavier gas, and that's the idea. A similar concept is called effusion, and this is gas particles passing through tiny openings. An example of this is a latex balloon. So if you've ever noticed that a balloon eventually deflates, if a helium balloon floats, a few days later it usually loses that ability. And that's because the latex material has really tiny holes in it. Now, we can't see the holes, but to gas particles, these holes are pretty big because gas particles are so tiny. So you can actually escape through them. Now, because lighter gas particles are moving faster because their mass is smaller, remember, the lower the mass, the higher the velocity, then the lighter particles will escape faster. And indeed, this is the case. If you fill two balloons with the same amount of, we'll say, uh, nitrogen here and then helium here, Notice we've got uh, nitrogen and we have helium. Now nitrogen sits, uh, it does not float because nitrogen is heavier than air. It's actually uh, it's slightly lighter than air because nitrogen is lighter than oxygen. But uh, the skin of the balloon makes it just heavy enough to, to sink. Helium, however, floats the same amount of gas. Over time, what you'll see is both deflate but the helium balloon deflates faster. Notice it gets smaller, and eventually the helium joins the nitrogen on the tabletop. Notice nitrogen should have also deflated, but not by much. Nitrogen has a mass of 28 grams, whereas helium has a mass of 4 grams, and that's a huge difference. And that difference accounts for the difference in effusion. And you can visually see this. All right, let's go on and talk about actual units of temperature. This lesson essentially is about temperature. Now, there are three units of temperature that we usually discuss. We use degrees Fahrenheit. The public uses degrees Fahrenheit in the United States. Uh, actually, there are also other countries. Uh, here it says famous countries like uh, Palau and uh, Guam, uh, somewhere in uh, the ocean, probably, away from civilization. Uh, so, But most of the world actually uses degrees Celsius. However, in chemistry, including in this chapter, we will be using Kelvin. Kelvin is going to be the unit of choice for us. And that's because, as you'll see, this is what's called an absolute scale. Absolute scale means there are no negative values, whereas the others do have negative values. So here is a comparison against the three scales. Now, the Celsius scale is the first one to look at. It was actually defined based on the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. So freezing point of water is 0, boiling point of water is 100. On the Fahrenheit scale, that corresponds to 32 and 212. On the Kelvin scale, it's 273 and 373. 
And what you'll notice is that the numbers are really high on the Kelvin scale. That's because it doesn't have any negatives, so it, it gets uh, high real quick. And then the other thing you want to notice is that the difference here for the Kelvin scale between these two is actually 100 degrees. Whereas in the Celsius scale, it's also 100 degrees, right? On the Fahrenheit scale, it's not 100 degrees. It's actually 180 degrees. So Fahrenheit degree, you can say, uh, well, a Celsius each Celsius degree requires more Fahrenheit degrees for it. That's the idea. Another interesting place to note is negative 40. Here is where Celsius and Fahrenheit meets. I don't know if you knew this or not, but if it gets down to negative 40 Celsius, and you ask yourself, well, that must be a crazy on the Fahrenheit scale. Uh, no, in fact, it's also negative 140 Fahrenheit. And then after this point, the Fahrenheit takes over. So before, you know, negative 10 is only 14 Fahrenheit, but then negative 80 is like negative 112 Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit takes over after negative 40. Uh, and that's, uh, that's because each Fahrenheit degree is different than each Celsius degree. OK, let's show you the equations to convert between these. So here you can convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit. What you have is you have this factor 5 ninths. So if you want to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, what you first have to do is subtract the 32. And this is because you have to get down to 0 Celsius, essentially. And then you multiply by 5 ninths. Now this ratio of 5 ninths is actually from the fact that there's 100 Celsius degrees in 180 Fahrenheit degrees. So this ratio is actually 5 ninths if you divide them. And so you would subtract 32 from Fahrenheit first to get it down to 0, and then multiply it by Celsius divided by Fahrenheit. Essentially what you're doing is you've got Fahrenheit, and you put Fahrenheit down here and Celsius up here, and that's why it's 5 Celsius for every 9 Fahrenheit. That's why you multiply by 5 ninths to convert it, essentially. And then if you go backwards, then you have to multiply by 9 fifths because you're going from Celsius to Fahrenheit, and then you get to add 32 at the end to get to Fahrenheit. So this is the second equation. Now, it's not as simple as simply multiplying by, by this section because you, you have to add this 32 because they're scaled off, essentially. They're, they have a different starting point. Now, to get to Kelvin is actually, Kelvin is connected to Celsius. So notice it's really easy here. To get to Kelvin, you simply take degree Celsius and add 273. And technically, Celsius is 273 degrees uh, lower than the Kelvin scale. That's the idea, where Kelvin is 273 degrees higher than the Celsius scale. So if you want to go to Celsius from Kelvin, you would subtract this 273. Now this 273 number is really important. This is actually absolute zero. It's re referring to the absolute zero number. This is the absolute temperature, okay, as you'll see here in a minute. So to be able to apply these equations, in fact, we're going to do some uh, calculations with them. Before we do that, it says how high in temperature go. This is for us to understand this idea of Kelvin. Why did we have to go to Kelvin? Why an extra scale? And the answer is, or the question is, is there an upper limit to temperature? And the answer is no. You can actually go as high as you want. You can get substances to be extremely, extremely hot. So you can actually get into millions of degrees, Celsius or Fahrenheit, whatever you like, degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we've achieved millions of degrees in laboratory conditions created plasma with an extremely high temperature. So there really is no upper limit. It's however much energy you have, that's how hot you can get. But the opposite question, is there a lower limit to temperature? And in this case, the answer is yes. There is a lower limit. And that lower limit is called absolute zero. And the way to think of this is if you have a gas, a sample of gas particles, you can technically start heating up those gas particles as, as high as you want, as and as you heat them up, they just start moving faster and faster and faster and faster. Eventually, you heat them up to the point where the electrons will disengage from the protons and ionize, and protons will fall, fall apart from the neutrons eventually. I mean, but you can get pretty, pretty high. You keep going up, up, up. But if you decide to cool this, right, if you decide to reduce the temperature, you can only get to the point where the motion stops. You can't get any slower than stopped. That's the idea. So the lowest possible temperature is when the molecules stop moving. And that turns out to be, on the, scale, on the Celsius scale, negative 273, which corresponds to zero Kelvin. 
Essentially, we took this coldest possible temperature and set it, made a new scale with it, set it at zero Kelvin, and then went on from there. And that's why the Kelvin has no negative numbers. And that's why it's called an absolute scale. Absolute, think of absolute in the tr in a mathematical sense, no negative numbers. And that's kind of the idea. All right, having explained this, we can actually do some examples. So here it says convert 245 Kelvin to degrees Fahrenheit. We can go ahead and use our two equations. The first equation will take us from Kelvin to Celsius. And we said that degrees Celsius, you take Kelvin. Now, interestingly, Kelvin does not have a degree sign. We just decided not to use one for, uh, for Kelvin. You do Kelvin minus 273 at first. So in this case, you get 245 minus 273, which uh, should be uh, pretty close to 28. In this case, negative 28. So that's correct. So we got negative 28 degrees Celsius, uh, degrees Celsius rather, not Fahrenheit. Negative 28. Celsius. Okay, and then we can take this and put it into Fahrenheit. We can use the other equation, degrees Fahrenheit, says that you take your Celsius, multiply it by 9 fifths, and then add 32 to it. So you'll do negative 28 times 9 fifths, and then add 32. Make sure you first multiply, and then you add. So multiply by 9, divide by 5, Plus 32, and this will be negative 18.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And since we got three sig figs, this should be the final answer. So really, we're just applying the two equations. Now, I do want you guys to remember these two equations. We'll be able to memorize the two equations uh, so that you can use them. But there they are. And here's a practice problem. Pause the video. Go ahead and try to convert from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. And this concludes for us second video. We'll talk about pressure in the third video.